So, we're looking now, we're continuing this discussion on the Quran, and we're looking at uh, topic two in the outline, if you're following that, called the Arabic Quran. We want to push out a bit more on what the Quran really is. So, Muslims believe that the Quran was sent down to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Muhammad is the, is the uh, medium through which this book then is, is proclaimed. And what would happen, as Muslims understand it, is that Gabriel would meet with Muhammad, he would teach him a portion of the Quran, which was only long enough that he could memorize. And he would memorize this, he'd, he would repeat it back to Gabriel, and Gabriel would say, well, you got it all right, Muhammad, but this particular sentence here, you got a little bit wrong. And so uh, then he would repeat it back and forth till he got it just right. And then, and of course, what Gabriel's teaching him is portions from this mother of the book in the heavens, portion by portion, he's bringing it down. And then Muhammad would go and he would recite, remember Quran is recitation, he would recite what he had heard to his disciples. They in turn would memorize it. And sometimes they would write portions of it down on pieces of pottery or scraps of papyrus or on stones and things like that, but mostly memorizing it. And you know, when you have a community memorizing, you can be assured that the memorization will be accurate because uh, everybody's memorizing it and they're checking with each other and making sure that what they are memorizing is an accurate transition, a, a transmission of what Muhammad himself had repeated. And so this, took on, this went on for 22 years, bit by bit, portions of this quote and were coming down and he's teaching, teaching it to his disciples until they had memorized it. So when we talk about modern day Muslims memorizing the Quran, remember that memorization of the Quran begins right from the beginning, right from the beginning, beginning with Muhammad himself. He was the first to memorize uh, these uh, revelations that Gabriel was bringing down to him. And Gabriel brings it down in Arabic. Why does Gabriel bring it in Arabic? Well, in the Quran, chapter 12, verse 2, we read, that God sent it down in Arabic so that they might understand. So, the Arab people are just thrilled. You know, they've never had a scripture. And now God is speaking the final revelation, as they understood it, in their own mother tongue, so that the Arab people might understand. It's just simply wonderful. But, the other part of it, of course, is that therefore it cannot be translated into other languages. Because if it's translated into other languages, it ceases to be the Arabic Quran. God is revealing an Arabic Quran so that they might understand. But when you translate it, it's not Arabic Quran anymore. It's now English Quran and so forth. And so Muslims refer to translations of the Quran as interpretations. So I have here with me today the, um, the uh, um, Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran, but they wouldn't call it a translation. They will call it, it does say translation, but the meaning of course is that it's an interpretation. Once it, in, once it is in English, it is not really the authentic Quran. It's the authentic Quran when it is in Arabic. And so for this reason, of course, wherever the Muslim movement moves, Arabic language follows it. I remember um, uh, several years ago, I was in a mosque in Baltimore in Maryland in the United States, and after the prayers, a very old man came in off the street, and um, he was tottery, a very old tottery man. And he comes up to the front, and he says to the Imam, I want to be a Muslim. And the Imam says, and the whole mosque says, Alhamdulillah, another convert. And then the Imam says, repeat the confession of faith after me. La ilallah. So the old man says, La ilallah. And then Muhammadun Rusullah. The old man says, Muhammadun Rusullah. And then the Imam says, You're a Muslim. You have made the confession of faith with intention. Now I just made the confession of faith, but without intention. So I'm not a Muslim. But when you say, La ilallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, with intention, then you're a Muslim. 
And then, the next statement by the Imam, God has revealed his will to us in the Quran, which is Arabic. And the ritual prayers, the Salat, which we offer five times a day here in this mosque, are in Arabic. So you must learn the Arabic language. But don't worry about that. We have an Arabic school here in the mosque. This evening before you leave for home, you must enroll in that school and begin to study Arabic. Now, when my father and mother went to work among the Zanaki people of Tanzania as missionaries in 1936, when the first Zanaki became believers in Jesus, my father, of course, said to them, praise be to God, you now believe in Jesus. The New Testament, the Injil, is written, the original Injil was written in the Greek language. So therefore, you must learn Greek. But don't worry, we have a Greek school which we have developed right here at Bumangi among the Zanaki people. Is, isn't that what he said? No, 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 no. No, what my father did was to translate the Gospel of Matthew into the Zanaki language. And um, they started a school, illiteracy. There was no schools among the Zanaki at all, among that part of the Zanaki tribe at all. They started a school. The first book that the Zanaki read was the Gospel of Matthew in their own language, you see. Now, you see the difference? between an incarnational understanding of Revelation, where God wants to speak our own language to our hearts, our mother tongue. God wants to communicate within our own culture and idiom. And a Tanzil understanding, where it comes down from above, in Arabic, you see, a very, very different approach to mission. So wherever Islam goes, Arabization goes with it, because God reveals the Quran in the Arabic language, just like happened in that mosque in Baltimore many years ago, where that dear old man who became a Muslim had now to begin to study the Arabic language. Wherever the church goes, and the Bible is translated into the language of people, why um, this revelation, which is now becoming incarnated in the language of people, really affirms traditional cultures. Wherever the Bible goes and it is received, it tends to, the gospel becomes clothed in the language of the people and the culture of the people. And this is one of the reasons that there is such enormous diversity in the Christian movement all over the world. Our Muslim friends often say to me, the church is such a diverse movement. I say, exactly right. We love our diversity. And it's because of our incarnational theology, where God seeks to speak with us and among us within our own language, within our own idiom. At Pentecost, when the church was formed, everybody who was there heard the, heard the gospel in their own native tongue. Thirteen languages mentioned right there at Pentecost, you see. And so wherever the church goes, translation of the scripture into the languages of the people becomes right at the heart of what we're about. And it's one of the reasons for the very rapid growth of the church throughout the world. People are just delighted. You don't need to enter into another culture. You can stay within your own culture, receiving God's word within your own culture. Now, looking at point three in our outline here, the Quran is organized then according to the size of chapters, with the longest chapter coming first. The exception is the Fatiha, this prayer that they offer 17 times a day as they go through their rakas. But other than that, the Fatiha comes first. Other than that, then, the longest chapter first and the shortest is last. So this has nothing to do with chronology. It simply has to do with the organization according to size. If our Muslim friends believed that chronology is important, then you would organize the Quran chronologically. But as we said in the earlier session today, the Quran comes down from above as their understanding. It transcends context and it transcends history. It just hangs above it, as it were. We're called to submit to the Quranic instruction, but the instruction itself transcends our culture, transcends our history. And so it is organized, not chronologically, but the longest first and the shortest last of all. 
And as I said earlier on, the Quran believes that uh, the Muslims believe the Quran brings to completion and clarification all the previous scriptures. And so, very sadly, from my understanding, very few Muslims really study the form of scripture seriously. Um, it is very rare in Islamic universities that there is a serious study of the Bible in terms of its message. There may be a study of the Bible as a critique of the Bible in some places, but um, very rarely a serious study of the Bible in an exploration of its message because of the perception that the Quran summarizes all truth that's necessary to know. And so although you must believe these former scriptures, there's very few Muslims actually seriously study these former scriptures. After Muhammad's death, very quickly, the Muslim community got to work at organizing the Quran, and within 20 years of his death, in the year 652, uh, the Quran was organized under Caliph Uthman in its current form. And all alternative, all alternative uh, renditions were, were burnt, were destroyed. And so you have this one, this one rendition, the Quran as we have it today. And like I mentioned earlier on, Muslims have a great concern for history, but this is not the Quran. They call this the Hadith. So you have these two sources, we talked about this earlier today. This two, these two sources of authority, the Hadith and the Quran. This is the history part, and then this is the revelation part, which gives us instruction on what we should believe and what we should do. <clears throat> and so, like I said earlier today, when they read, say, the Gospel of Matthew, it's quite confusing, because Matthew combines both uh, instruction and history, you see. Having said that, however, the Bible can be extremely interesting to Muslims because of the historical narrative. I mentioned the other day how when we lived in Somalia, we had this Bible story book for children on our, um, on our, within our living room. And whenever Muslims would come to visit us, the first book they'd pick up would be that Bible story book for children. A friend of mine living in the Middle East for many years tells about that in the um, Emirates, every year they would have a... Um, book sale, a big book sale, and uh, Bibles were welcome. So they'd have a huge stand for Bibles. And uh, many, many uh, Muslims would come out of Arabia and out of the Emirates and so forth, and they would buy books at this book fair, including many, many Bibles. And one day, a woman came by, dressed in her hijab, completely in black, you couldn't see her face at all, with seven children in tow. And she came up to this Bible stand, and she said, do you have a Bible story book for children. I don't know how she ever got such a thought in her mind. And my friend said, no, we don't. And she said, I'm so very, very sorry about that. And she walks on with her seven children in tow. And he decided on the spot to commit himself to developing that Bible story book for children. And so they took the Lion's Bible story book for children with a picture, 366, 360 stories, with a picture for each um, story and translated it into Arabic with a strong international translation team working together at that. And um, this book has now sold tens and tens of thousands throughout the region. Both Muslims and Christians purchased this book. It's on the, on the uh, dining room table of many, many homes when uh, Saddam Hussein was still holding forth in Iraq at the annual book fair in Iraq, they would take uh, a truckload of these Bible story books for children into Iraq and sell them at the book fair. On one occasion, a group of Saddam Hussein's children came by and bought a whole stack of these Bible story books for children. So we knew that book was being read in his home. I used to pray that the Lord would use it to speak to his own heart, and maybe God did, I don't know. But uh, we knew that those books were in the home of Saddam Hussein. Why such interest? Because it tells the narrative, you see. The Quran gives allusions to the narrative, but the Bible is the narrative. And so you read those narratives, it is extremely interesting to many, many Muslims, although, as I said, also a perplexity why the narrative would be scripture. But having said that perplexity, great interest in it. And I think this is one reason that this Bible study course for, for Muslims that we develop called the people of God is so interesting because it tells the narrative. It starts from Genesis 1, goes through Genesis 22, tells the story. We call this a chronological Bible study. 
So for Christians, though, and like we said, we believe that God reveals himself by what he does in history. God is meeting us. He met Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He met Moses at the burning bush. He met Israel at Mount Sinai. The Bible is about all of that. He met Joshua at the Jordan River. He met Isaiah in the temple. God met the disciples of Jesus on the day of Pentecost. And one day, God met me. You know, it's why I'm a Christian. He met me. Supremely, God meets us in Jesus Christ. And the Bible reveals that God acts in history. He is revealed by what he does in history. For example, God acted through the flood at the time of Noah. God acted by delivering Israel from slavery in Egypt. God acted by signs and wonders before Israel at Mount Sinai. God acted by causing the walls of Jericho to fall down. And supremely, God acts through Jesus Christ. And he's acted by creating the church. And he continues to act today. He's acting among us here as we're gathered together in this seminar. And God reveals himself then by meeting us through his acts in history. And that's what the Bible is about. God always reveals himself within our culture and history. That's why the Bible is primarily a history book. The account of God's acts in history and our response to what he is doing is the account of his revelation of himself. The Bible has been written over a 1,500 years of time. Year after year, century after century, portions of the Bible being written by a multitude of prophets. And he's inspired these writers to, to describe what the meaning of his acts in history is. And so it's the acts of God in history, and it is what the inspired writers help us to understand by what he is doing. We think of Revelation in the Bible as incarnational. He chooses to meet us within our own culture and history. For example, Peter writes like Peter, and Paul writes like Paul. I remember at the Central London Mosque that night when we were having the dialogue on Revelation, which I've referred to earlier today, and I said just what I said right now. Biblical revelation is incarnational. It's God revealing himself and we responding. And the stuff of revelation is our response and God's action. And the revelation is clothed in human language and culture. Paul writes like Paul. Peter writes like Peter. And my dialogue companion said, Oh, I hope you all noticed. Shank has confessed openly and publicly for all of us in this mosque tonight to hear. The Bible is truly corrupted. For he has said that Paul writes like Paul and Peter writes like Peter, and that the personality of the writers is part of the content of biblical revelation. That means it is corrupted. But thanks be to God, the Koran in no way whatsoever reflects the personality of Muhammad. Muhammad was only the tube through which the revelation came. So the revelation was brought by Gabriel and Muhammad became the mouthpiece but his personality and culture in no way at all touched that revelation. You see, wow. <laughs> wow. And that's why when the Quran is in another language other than Arabic, it's not really Quran, because then culture is beginning to touch it, you see. But in biblical revelation, it's incarnational. God speaks to human idiom and culture. Paul writes like Paul, Peter like Peter. And we translate the Bible so God will speak within the language of people everywhere. That's why the Bible has been translated into languages everywhere. Some 3,000 languages have portions of the Bible. Translation of the Bible is a vigorous missionary enterprise. And frankly, it's one of the reasons that the church is growing so incredibly rapidly. In Africa, for example, in the year um, 1973, I think it was, the number of Christians in Africa exceeded the number of Muslims. And today we estimate probably about 50 million more Christians than Muslims in Africa. Why? This movement toward the church. Much of it is because the Bible is available in the language of people. You see, you don't have to become Arabized or you don't have to become Greekized to become a Christian. That God speaks within the culture of the people. Laman Sana is a uh, reputed uh, theologian, teach, taught, has taught at Yale many, many years, Yale University, comes from West Africa, the Gambia, 
uh, his roots were Muslim, he's now, now a Christian leader, Christian theologian. And um, he says that across the African continent, the Islamic movement keeps saying, we must cleanse Islam of um, local cultural um, practices and um, of local culture. Whereas the church all across the continent says, we must incarnate the gospel within the culture, that the gospel blesses, it transforms, but it blesses the culture. It doesn't call people away from the culture. Islam, the tug is away. As people begin to practice Sharia and all that sort of thing, it's away from the culture. Whereas this incarnational movement of the gospel takes root within the culture, transforms it to be sure, but not in a way that pulls people away from the culture. So the church takes deep root within the culture. His book is called Translating the Message. Very, very interesting book on the way in which the Quran on the one hand and the Bible on the other hand relate with culture across the African continent. Now, many Muslims accuse Christians of corrupting the Bible. And we've talked about that before. There are several reasons for this. First, we've talked already about the Bible is mostly a history book. That's a perplexity. Another reason is the many translations of the Bible. Where's the Greek New Testament, they'll say. So when I lived in Somalia, I always had on my shelf a copy of my Greek New Testament. I would say here, well, I have the original right here in my home, you see. Or the Hebrew Old Testament, it's a good thing to have that as well, to remind our Muslim friends that we are in touch and we respect very highly the original translations. The other reason is because of contradictions between the Bible and the Quran. For example, when I was teaching at the University of Nairobi, in the World Religions Department, and Katarega uh, was teaching with me, I'll never forget the day when students in the class said, so you believe that the Torah, the Injil, and the Zabur are revealed by God? Absolutely, I'm a Muslim, and all Muslims believe that those are revealed scriptures. Absolutely, absolutely. Then a student said, but there's contradictions between the Injil and the Quran. For example, the Quran says Jesus was not crucified, and the crucifixion is just central to the Injil and its um, witness concerning Jesus. And he said, it's because the Quran, because the Injil is corrupted. So I said in class, why do you say that? He said, because the Quran says so. Oh, I said, where does the Quran say that the Bible is corrupted? I'll show you after class. So after class, he took me to his office and we looked together at this verse in the Quran that says that there are among the Christians those who, when they, when they um, speak the Bible, distort it with their tongues. This is 378, 378. So I said to Katarega, oh, it says that we distort it with our tongues, which is true. Sometimes we, we misquote the Bible, but it does not say that we've taken the text and changed it, you see. Now, there's many Muslims will say that the Bible is corrupted because the Quran says so, just like Katarega said that. But as I study the Quran, I see no evidence within the Quran of a charge that the Bible has been corrupted. In fact, quite to the contrary, I see many verses in the Quran that say God will not permit the Bible to be corrupted and that it's not corrupted. I remember some years ago, I was in a mosque in Philadelphia and we were talking about this and the Imam was from Turkey had a doctor from Temple University, a different imam than the one I talked about yesterday. And uh, he was saying how the Bible is corrupted. And I said, why would you say that? He said, the Quran says so. So I said, please show me, and us Christians tonight, where the Quran says the Bible is corrupted. And he was sort of a feisty kind of fellow, you know, a mischievous kind of guy. And he threw up his hands and he says, too many to mention, too many to mention. I said, in that case, please give me one reference. He said, I tell you, Dr. Shank, too many to mention. I said, we need to be people that are looking for the truth. 
if there's references in the Quran that say the Bible is corrupted, we should be able to look at them. But I said, I've studied the Quran carefully, and I'm, I'm not aware of any reference whatsoever. There's two references that Muslims sometimes use. One is this one that says, there is among them those who corrupt it with their mouths. It's true. Sometimes we misquote the Bible, but it does not say that we've taken the scripture and we've corrupted it. It does not say that. There's another reference that says that there is among the Christians, not just Christians, among people, those who write false scripture and distribute it, saying it is false scripture. That's true. There's false scripture has been written. You know, don't do that. Don't write false scripture. And we well know that the last verse of the book of Revelation warns us against writing false scripture. Don't do that. We take that very, very seriously. But it does not say that we have actually changed the scriptures. It doesn't say that at all, you see. So as I look at the Quran, the Quran in fact says quite the contrary, that God will not permit his scriptures to be, to be uh, corrupted. And I don't believe that either <laughs> Muhammad or the Quran <laughs> suggest that the Bible is corrupted. Quite to the contrary, both Muhammad and the Quran have complete confidence in the reliability of the scriptures. And in our dialogue with Muslims, we seek to interpret uh, that reality to them as we speak with them. Yes. So how do we respond? How do we respond to this charge that the Bible is corrupted? And believe me, we find it everywhere. One of the reasons for this is a Muslim uh, apologetic called Ahmadidat. Ahmed Didat, he was a South African. He is not living anymore. But he has written a lot of books which, um, which uh, seek to prove that the Bible is corrupted. And this literature is all over the place. So personally, I've been working with Muslims now for some 40 years. The charge of corruption is much more prevalent now than it was some years ago. Um, and I think it is much of the influence of this Ahmed Didat. So how do we respond? Here are some ways in which I seek to respond. One is to say that... Um, simply realize that the Christian and Muslim understanding of scriptures are different. And to confess clearly that we believe God reveals himself personally in history. Therefore, the Bible needs to be primarily an account of God's acts in history. Also, we bear witness that there are hundreds of ancient Old Testament manuscripts and at least 5,000 ancient New Testament manuscripts. These documents enable scholars to be confident that our modern Bible is an accurate transmission of the original. In regards to the Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain some Old Testament manuscripts that are over 2,000 years old, go back before Christ, these Dead Sea Scrolls. And these greatly strengthen confidence in the reliability of the Old Testament as an accurate transmission of the Hebrew text, the original text. Word for word, dot for dot, comma by, by comma, they are the same. Um, so uh, that gives great confidence in the, in the uh, authenticity of the text that we have today. And we know that God will always protect his word. The Quran says, there is none that can alter the words and decrees of God. And the Bible says, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And I share with my Muslim friends, are you suggesting that God is not strong enough to protect his word? That's impossible. God will take care of his word. And furthermore, like I said earlier, Muhammad believed that the scriptures are reliable and trustworthy. The Quran likewise bears witness to the reliability of these former scriptures. So when did they get corrupted? They could never have gotten corrupted after Muhammad. Impossible. Because by 600 AD, the Bible was in multiple languages in many countries around the world. It could not have gotten corrupted after that. So it's an impossibility that it would have been corrupted after Muhammad. Now, we have here uh, a number of references um, from the uh, Quran in regards to the Bible, and I don't think I need to take time to read them here, um, but uh, these are both from the Hadith and from the Quran itself, references in regards to, to the reliability of the scriptures. And in this book itself, which is our textbook, we have a section on the Quran and the Bible with all of these references included in the textbook itself. So for this public lecture, I don't think that's necessary to review them. But in your private study, you can look at these references. Just to say in summary, within the Quran, there is very high respect for the reliability, 
and trustworthiness of the Bible. But our witness is not based upon the Quran. We bear witness from the Bible itself, which declares that God will never permit his word to be corrupted. And Christians have taken that very seriously. The church over the years has often laid down its life to protect and nurture these scriptures. Some of you even here have had parents, grandparents, who've laid down their lives in this commitment. We believe these scriptures are the authoritative word of God. We do not say to Muslims that the Quran is corrupted. We believe the Quran is an accurate transmission of what Muhammad declared. We believe that. I do. You know. We plead with Muslims, do not say the Bible is corrupted. Respect it, as the Quran itself calls you to respect it. That's our invitation. No. I will say, as we're wrapping up here, that, um, that um, I have written a book about this. One thing I do when, when there's a challenge like this is write a book about it. <laughs> like this People of God Correspondence Course, you know. He says, I want a simple book that describes Christianity. I said, okay, I'll write it. And so when I was living in Nairobi, and we'd have these dialogues with the Muslim theologians, they'd sit in our room and they'd say, the Bible was corrupted, the Bible was corrupted, so forth. So I wrote a book about it. And this is a little book that called The Holy Book of God, an Introduction, and uh, it's simply a confession of faith in the reliability of the Bible and some of the reasons why we believe the Bible, um, uh, some of the evidences for the reliability of the Bible. We have a couple pictures in there, for example, this picture of the caves at Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, you know. And um, I give this out to Muslims very, very freely. It's not polemical, it's simply confessional. Yes, we know the Bible is trustworthy. Here, read this book and you'll see why we know that it is trustworthy. The book trying to speak to this question. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. Okay, final question, and then we conclude. Yes. Could you read maybe one or two from Quran? Just the, the verses. Okay, sure, sure, Just sure. Two. Well, they're right here in the outline, if you're looking at the outline there. Mm -hmm. For example, God has revealed the former scriptures. Allah sent down the Taurat of the prophet Moses and the gospel in Jeel of Jesus the Messiah. That is chapter 3, 3. For to them was entrusted the protection of God's book. God has entrusted to the Christians the protection of God's book. And Christians have taken that very, very seriously. I say to my Muslim friends, I have ancestors who have died in their commitment to this book, to the message of this book. <clears throat> Maida means uh, the table. Each of these are, are names of, uh, that you have in your outline here. Each of these are names of surahs in the Quran. Ali Imran is chapter surah three, and Maida is chapter four. Mm -hmm. O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the law, the Taurat, and the gospel in Jeel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Again, calling us to stand upon the scriptures. And this would be 571. The writings of Moses are the furqan of truth. That means the criterion of truth. The writings of Moses, the criterion of truth. That would be 21, 48 and 247. Another reference. It is also guidance, light, and mercy to humankind. It is the book of Allah, referring to the writings of Moses. And there's a number of references there, one of which is Maida again, 547. No change can there be in the words of God. How can you corrupt the words of God? 
God won't permit that. 1064. In regard to the gospel, the Quran states, therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law, the Taurat, that had come before him, the Messiah, a guidance and an admonition. That the gospel is a confirmation of the Taurat. 549. The Quran also advises the Prophet Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed unto you, then ask those who have been reading the book from before you. And this is 1094. I like that verse very much. And occasionally, the Quran insists that God's word cannot be corrupted. Here's an example of that affirmation. Rejected were the apostles before thee, with patience and constancy, they bore their rejection and their wrongs until our aid did reach them. There is none that can alter the words and decrees of God. God protected the apostles and he protected his word as well. That's 634. And then commands to the people of the book. This is the Quranic commands to us who are Christians or to Jews likewise, who are people of the book. Remember, God took a covenant from the people of the book to make it known and clear to mankind and not to hide it. <laughs> and here's, a, here's where Christians often have conversation with Muslims. Why do you say we can't distribute scriptures when the Quran commands us to distribute them? You see? In Egypt, uh, the Christian churches and the uh, authorities have had years of dialogue about that. And in recent years now, they've gotten permission to put a large billboard on the uh, Cairo Alexandria Expressway advertising Bibles that can be purchased at the Bible Society in Egypt. Right there in Egypt, you see. As the dialogue unfolds, oftentimes space does develop for the distribution of scriptures. We need to remind our Muslim friends that we have been commanded to make the scriptures available. There is among them a section that distorts the book with their tongues. We, ref we referred to this already. As they read, you would think it is part of the book, but it is, it is not part of the book. And they say, that is from God, but it is not from God. It is they who tell a lie against God, and well they know it. Good advice, brothers, sisters. Don't distort the Bible. Don't distort the Bible with your tongue. When you quote it, Quote it accurately. That's 378. Ye people of the book, why do you close with falsehood and conceal the truth while you have knowledge? Declare the truth of the Bible. Don't hide it. 371. And then this one. Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from God to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to them for what their hands do write and for the gain that they make by writing false scripture and then selling it. Don't do that. You see, it reminds me of the last verses of, of Revelation where we read, don't corrupt the scriptures. Don't add to this book. If you do, God will judge you. You see, absolutely. Yes. We can get the scripture before uh, um, the Muhammad time, and it seems like during his time it was, it was the right scripture, right? So basically we say, hey, it's the same today day and, and today and many years ago, so we can prove with this kind of argument that this is the same scripture, it's not false. There is a false scripture, but the scripture that Muhammad referred in this year's, this is what's circulating. Can we prove this? Uh, of course, of course, of course. Like, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are written about 200 years before Christ. This is over 2,000 years old, those Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and when you compare those Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hebrew and the Dead Sea Scrolls, with our modern Hebrew texts, they're the same. You see, and they, were, they, they, they had wide circulation at the time of Muhammad. The Dead Sea Scrolls are found right out there, not far from Arabia, there in the, at Qumran, you know. And of course, the New Testament. By the time of Muhammad, there was at least 5,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament circulating. Primarily in Greek, but other languages as well have been translated. And uh, our scholars have access to those ancient manuscripts. 
You see. If Muhammad mm -hmm. writing about Injil over there in Torah, yes. that means he can have access to those Absolutely, groups. yeah, but not in Arabic, see. Okay. He, he did not know these other languages, but surely they were available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> His problem was he couldn't read in those languages. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Quran has very high respect for the scriptures. We thank God for that. And we are people of the book who stand upon those scriptures. And that's what we bear witness from. And that's what we share. That's what we share. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.